And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Please turn for a few moments to 2 Peter chapter 1, reading some verses from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21, in which Peter refers to this encounter that he had with the transfigured Christ. 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 16. <coughs> Second Peter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honour and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mount. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless these readings to us. Please turn back to Matthew 17. As the years pass, we tend to reminisce more and more. Yesterday afternoon, I had a phone call with a dear relative of mine, Margaret Walker. Margaret and her twin sister, Elizabeth, are twins. Are tw well, twins, obviously, they are were having their birthday, their 91st birthday in River House down in Newcastle and I phoned to wish Margaret and Elizabeth a happy birthday and she was saying that as the years have gone past they have reminisced more and more and thought back on wonderful blessings that they have received from God. Margaret and Elizabeth were converted at the age of 11 on the same day and for 80 years they've been walking with the Lord until now they're 91 years of age and they've been a tremendous encouragement to Jenny and me and our family and the whole family circle through their prayers. And I thank God for them. Well, they were looking back on wonderful blessings in their lives on their birthday yesterday in the midst of the challenges that they have faced. We do increasingly reflect and reminisce as our years go by. I wonder as you look back on your life today, do certain times of blessing stand out in your memory? Maybe there's a particular event that was a really special event for you. And this has had a, a lasting impact on your life. Or perhaps a certain experience was unforgettable and you're just so thankful for it. Or maybe a certain period in your life was particularly blessed and thinking back on such times or experiences or events fills you with gratitude. These things meant a lot to you at the time, and they still do. And you treasure them, and you'll never forget them. 
Friends, I'm quite sure that this was the case with the first disciples. As the first followers of Jesus looked back on their years with their master, they must have had many, many great memories which made them marvel and fill with thankfulness. And yet there were surely particular experiences during their days with Jesus that were especially precious. For at certain moments in the ministry of Jesus, the disciples were particularly struck and impacted by his glory. There was that time when they witnessed the astounding miracle by their master in calming the raging sea. And they were filled with absolute awe and wonder. Because in that unforgettable moment, the awesomeness of their master's glory overcame them. And then the same thing happened when Peter and his companions witnessed the miraculous catch of fish. They were totally overwhelmed with the greatness of the one standing before them, who was in control even in the position of the fish in the sea. And so at different times and in different ways, the disciples had their eyes opened more to Jesus' unsurpassable glory. And they would never have forgotten those occasions. But today, friends, we've come to the event that was undoubtedly the most memorable occasion of all for three of the disciples. It was the day in Jesus' earthly ministry when their master's majestic glory was revealed in the most remarkable and overpowering manner. The time of his transfiguration, Peter and company were obviously deeply impacted by their encounter with the transfigured Christ. Peter wrote in his second letter of being an eyewitness of his majesty and how often Peter must have reflected on that awesome meeting with his majestic master on the top of the mount. Before we take a good look at what happened on that momentous occasion on the mount, just glance back to the end of chapter 16, please. What was Jesus calling for at that point in his ministry, at the end of chapter 16? He was calling for wholehearted discipleship. Jesus was emphasizing 100% commitment from his followers. And he emphasized that such wholehearted discipleship has a real cost. If we are to truly follow Jesus, we must be ready to deny ourselves and to serve him sacrificially. We must be prepared to take up our cross and to suffer for him. And so at the close of chapter 16, Jesus stressed the cost of being a true disciple. We have to be willing to lose our lives for him. Yet in the last verses of chapter 16, Jesus also indicated another side of being his disciple. Yes, there's the cost. But he says, those who lose their lives for his sake actually gain them. Indeed, their very souls are saved. And in this life, nothing will ever separate them from their saviour. And then at death, they will enter into his glory to be with him forever. And so the immeasurable benefits of being a true Christian are already communicated to us clearly in chapter 16. But now here at the start of chapter 17, Jesus points forward to the most extraordinary blessing that awaits every true follower of Christ. With tantalizing brevity, Jesus points ahead to how his followers will actually share in his glory. Indeed, his followers will be glorified along with him in the world to come. Before we consider this extraordinary episode, note Jesus' words in chapter 16, verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now at first glance, these words are puzzling. What could they possibly mean? What was Jesus referring to when he talked of some of his men seeing him coming in his kingdom? Well, I believe an obvious clue lies in the very next words, chapter 17, verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Jesus took these men with him to witness his transfiguration. Friends, Matthew clearly draws a connection between 
what Jesus said in chapter 16, verse 28, and what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration from chapter 17, verse 1 onwards. Because there on the Mount, as he was transfigured, three of his disciples would see the power of God's kingdom before their very eyes. They'd behold the King of Kings in his resplendent glory. And therefore, some who were standing with Jesus, as he made this prediction in verse 28 of chapter 16, would witness the glory of God's kingdom in an altogether new way at the transfiguration. It was as though they would catch a glimpse of all that Jesus would be when his kingdom would finally come. His overwhelming kingly glory would be momentarily made manifest to them. And therefore, according to Matthew, Jesus' words in chapter 16, verse 28, were fulfilled at the end of that week when Jesus took his three companions up the high mountain. Friends, there are a number of features I want us to note of this extraordinary event. Firstly, the appearance of the sun. In verse 1, we're told Peter, James and John headed head up the mountainside with their master. Jesus was taking these three and reminds us of their privileged relationship with him. On other occasions, Jesus also looked to these men in particular. For example, they were the only men who were allowed into Jairus' house. These three were the only ones privileged to see Jesus raise Jairus' 12-year-old girl back to, to life again. And then again, these three were the ones whom Jesus took into the Garden of Gethsemane to watch and pray with him. Plainly, these three guys had a special relationship with Jesus. They were given more access to Jesus at key moments in his ministry. They were even more privileged than the other disciples. This was evidently the case once again here at the Transfiguration. Here they accompanied Jesus up the high mount to witness this remarkable uh, event. Now, the mention of the high mountain is significant. In Old Testament times, where had God revealed himself to both Moses and Elijah? On the Mount of God, on Mount Sinai. On that mountain, both Moses and Elijah had received a vision of the glory of God. And therefore, in going up a high mountain, Jesus wasn't just seeking solitude for himself and his men. Jesus was communicating to them something of the immense significance of what was about to happen. On that very mount, the glory of the living God was about to be revealed to these three men. And it would be an even more wonderful revelation than those given to Moses and Elijah. On this high mount, these three disciples would witness the human appearance of Jesus altered in the most awesome manner and they would behold the radiance of God's glory well this is precisely what happened on that mountain top within a few meters of them these three men saw the human appearance of their master clearly change for just a few moments the veil of his humanity was lifted and the body of Jesus was enveloped with splendor and light. Now the Chambers Dictionary states that a transfiguration is a transformation or a glorification in appearance. Well, that is exactly what was happening to Jesus here. His appearance was transformed as he became radiant with glory. Now Mark put it this way in his gospel account. His clothes became dazzling white whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And so the appearance of Jesus was gloriously transformed. How stunningly dazzling and overwhelming for the disciples. In the Old Testament, the glory of God is at times expressed as shining brilliance or as a bright light. We were singing in Psalm 104, O oh Lord my God, you're very great. You're clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. <coughs> well, here, friends, is Jesus wrapped in light. Yet here is the Nazarene, our Savior, enveloped with brightness, 
and his unsurpassable splendor was unveiled and his glory radiated with overwhelming brilliance. And for these few short moments, Jesus resumed the divine glory that was his with the Father before the world began. And so for these most privileged disciples, faith momentarily passed into sight because they actually beheld with their very eyes the exalted, glorified Lord. The King of Heaven shone before them in his overwhelming glory and majesty. Clearly, this was the highest honour for these disciples. And what an encouragement to their faith it was in the years to come. As these disciples served their master in the midst of painful persecutions in the days that followed, this was a moment that they would reflect upon often. And it would have spurred them on, wouldn't it? Because they knew that no matter what the cost of serving Christ, no matter how severe their sufferings, they were serving the King of Kings, reigning in resplendent glory. They had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. And so they had no doubt their master was in complete charge of his entire creation. Their saviour was supreme, reigning in splendour, even over the persecutions that they were suffering. But friends, this mountaintop meeting wasn't just a tremendous boost and encouragement to the early disciples. Their extraordinary encounter is also a wonderful encouragement to you and me if we are following this king today. Christian friends, whatever our present circumstances, our saviour is still supreme and sovereign. No matter what hardships are hitting you, your master reigns over all. The one that you depend upon is still the light of the world, shining in splendour in the darkness of our fallen age and generation. We may wish to see such a revelation of the glory of King Jesus with our own eyes, just like these three disciples. But Peter actually says in 2 Peter chapter 1, in those verses that we read earlier, that the testimony of scripture about Jesus is as clear and powerful as any word that we might hear directly from heaven. So Peter tells us that if you and I want to see the glory of Jesus, we must meditate on God's inspired word just as eagerly as he lingered on the mountainside. And therefore, friends, there's wonderful encouragement here for disciples of Jesus in every generation in this transfiguration, because we can all see, still see the majestic glory of our sovereign Saviour as we dwell upon his word and as his spirit opens the eyes of our hearts increasingly to our Saviour's kingly splendour. My friend, do you think about this as you open this inspired book day by day in your home and as you come to church? Do you appreciate how you can encounter our reigning Redeemer as you turn to this truth day by day? And are you praying for the eyes of your heart to be open to his splendour increasingly? The transfiguration of Jesus isn't just a powerful encouragement for all of us who have surrendered our lives to him. It's also a solemn warning to all who refuse to submit to the King of Kings. Because what has Jesus just been speaking about? He's just declared at the end of chapter 16 that he will come again. He's announced that the Son of Man will reappear with his Father's great glory and with his holy angels. And what will be the purpose of his return? What will King Jesus do when he reappears? The Lord will perform a most solemn, earth-shattering responsibility and duty. Christ Jesus will carry out his judgment of all people everywhere. And so the sovereign Saviour will return in overwhelming glory. And all people across the globe will stand before his judgment throne. Therefore, friends... There's a vital link between chapter 16, verse 28, and chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. And the link is this. The transfiguration in chapter 17 was a momentary revelation 
of Jesus' kingly majesty. And this revelation points way beyond itself to the end of the world mentioned in chapter 16. Because on that final day, all eyes shall behold the kingly majesty and almighty power of Jesus Christ. So do you see the transfiguration is a solemn, solemn warning to everyone who has not yet bowed their knee to Christ as Lord. It says to them that the day is approaching when there will be no hiding from him. And on that final day, they will be confronted by this majestic king as their judge. And they will have, if they've remained unrepentant, he will condemn them to eternal punishment in hell. What fear will grip their souls when they see the Son of Man appearing in the clouds. They will be overcome with terror. Along with millions upon millions from all nations of the earth, they will mourn with inconsolable grief because they will be suddenly convicted of the gravity of their guilt and of the sinfulness of their stubbornness. Jesus tells us this himself in Matthew chapter 24. And in Revelation chapter 6, which we thought about two weeks ago, we're told how the unrepentant on that final day will try to hide in the caves as they cry out to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. But there'll be no place to hide from the all-seeing judge. There'll be no escape. Every one of us must appear before his judgment seat. And so the transfiguration of Jesus should cause us to pause and ponder our ways. One day, we ourselves will be confronted by Christ in his awesome glory. When this happens, will we be filled with overflowing joy as we welcome him as our sovereign saviour? Or will we be filled with absolute terror as we try to flee from the king's righteous wrath and judgment. What will be your position on that final day? Will it be the happiest day imaginable for you or the most horrifying day imaginable? Well, having considered the appearance of the sun, let's consider the appearing of the prophets. Verse 3, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. What were these Old Testament prophets talking to Jesus about? Luke actually tells us in his gospel account. In chapter 9, verse 30, Luke says, Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And so these two great figures of the Old Testament spoke with Jesus about his coming death in the capital of Jerusalem. Plainly, Moses and Elijah knew exactly what was going to happen to Jesus. They knew that wicked men would put him to death. But this would be no tragic accident. As we're told in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, the death of Jesus was by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And therefore, the death of Jesus was not something that would happen because God's plan had gone wrong. The God had of heaven meant for his son to die. Indeed, God had planned this death before he'd created the world. For this was the way his people would be saved. So this is what Moses, Elijah, and Jesus talked about on the mount that day. They discussed this approaching act of sacrifice by Jesus, the greatest sacrificial act in the history of mankind. They spoke together about how God the Father was working out his plan of salvation through his Son. And so they talked about the coming crucifixion. Now the whole of the Old Testament pointed forward to this pivotal event in the history of the world. Both the law and the prophets were all about the coming Messiah and his atoning death. But what God had foretold in the Old Testament down through the centuries was now about to be fulfilled. The long-awaited Messiah was now about to give himself as a substitute for his people on the cross. 
Christian friends, the appearing of these prophets. It should be a tremendous encouragement to you and me, for it reminds us that the wonderful plan of God to save us, his people through Jesus, has been carefully worked out. Saving us from our sin and rebellion wasn't an afterthought of our God. He'd purposed all along for his people to be saved in Christ. We live in a world of apparent chaos and confusion. Man's wickedness seems to have no bounds and his rebellion against God is evident on every side. But in the midst of all the sin and godlessness of our age, the God of heaven is working out his glorious plan of salvation and his saving purposes through Jesus are being fully accomplished. The Lord is saving his people. Our Redeemer is building his church. Our King is extending his kingdom. He was doing it in Old Testament times. He was doing it in the early church. And he's doing it today. Christ's glorious, gracious rule is being extended throughout the world as his gospel goes forth to all nations. We never hear about this on the BBC or Sky News. The advance of Christ's kingdom is never discussed on political programmes. But this is what is happening behind the scenes. This is what our God is doing behind the headlines. Our King is working out his amazing plan of salvation for the blessing of his people and for the glory of his name. Let's think thirdly together about the approval of the Father. Verse 5 records the resounding words of God the Father. But note, just before we have God's wonderful words, Peter blurted out something silly. Peter and his companions had been half asleep, it seems. Luke tells us this in his account. Well, suddenly the three of them were wide awake and Jesus, in all of his resplendent glory, stands before them, accompanied by Elijah and Moses. Well, clearly the disciples were totally overawed. And James and John, not surprisingly, were speechless. What they were witnessing was literally out of this world and totally overwhelming. But not untypically, Peter blurted out the very first thing that came to mind. Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and Elijah. Mark says that Peter didn't really know what to say. He was so overcome. And so Peter would have been better to have said nothing, like his two friends. But impulsive Peter blurted out his proposal without really thinking. His offer to build three tabernacles shows that he totally misunderstood what was happening. Peter seemed to think that the final age had dawned, and that it was now time for all of God's people to dwell together. It appears Peter thought that the kingdom of heaven had arrived in all of its fullness and that Moses and Elijah were here to stay. And so Peter proposed making tabernacles for them. He didn't realise that Moses and Elijah were only back for a fleeting visit, helping his master prepare for the horror of Calvary. Peter must have forgotten everything Jesus had said about how he must suffer and die. Well, following Peter's foolish words came the wise, wonderful words of God the Father. As a cloud overshadowed them, the Father declared, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. What was the significance of the cloud? In Old Testament times, the cloud had been the sign of God's presence, his Shekinah glory. Think of when God's people were in the wilderness. When Moses was on Mount Sinai, a cloud covered the mount. And so the cloud was a sign of God's holy presence back at the Exodus. Well, the cloud here in Matthew 17 was a symbol of the same reality. It was a sign that God the Father was present. And from the cloud, God the Father declared these hugely significant words. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Plainly the Father was conveying his total approval of Jesus, his son, in the clearest possible manner. The father was telling his son, telling the world, that Jesus was his beloved son. 
and the Son brought him great pleasure and delight. But why did the Father make such a moving declaration at this point? What was about to happen? Jesus was about to carry out his Father's will by going to the horror of the cross. That was his Father's will, for him to suffer the punishment for the sins of all his people. And Jesus was willing to carry this through. No wonder his father declared his absolute approval. But we not only have the approval of the father here. Note lastly, the appeal of the father. This is my beloved son, listen to him. My friend, this is God's exhortation to you and to me today. Having demonstrated so powerfully the uniqueness and majesty of his son through his transfiguration, the God of heaven now commands you, listen to him. Listen to everything he has to say to you. And surely what God had in mind here especially were the instructions Jesus had just given his disciples concerning his suffering and how they themselves must be willing to serve and to suffer for him. Friends, this is the vital point we must be willing to listen to. This is the key issue we've got to take to heart. Following Jesus, we must be ready for service. Following Jesus, we must be ready for sacrifice. And following Jesus, we must be ready even to suffer for his sake. Are you hearing what King Jesus is saying today? Friend, the God of heaven is making this appeal to you. Listen to his son. Well, I ask you, are you listening to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's quite possible to come to church. It's quite possible to read the Bible and to still never really listen to the Lord. Are you listening right now to the sovereign Saviour shining forth in splendour who will return to judge all mankind? You would be an utter fool not to do so. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. May the Lord enable all of us to have receptive, teachable hearts that we take heed to the life-giving word of Christ. Let us join in prayer together.